Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. It's really, really important that we don't walk around with this vague sense of failure. Because the devil will start on you from the moment you open your eyes in the morning and actually before they're open if your mind is awake, telling you and rehearsing to you what you're not. You're not. You're not. You're not. You didn't. You're not. You're not. And I want to teach you today how to talk back to him and say, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. Well, I'm talking, doing a series called Pressing In and Pressing On. And to press means to press against your pressure. If you don't have any pressure coming against you, then there's no need to press. There's a lot of different things that we have to press beyond if we want to really enjoy the life that Jesus died to give us. I could probably talk about a hundred different things if I could stay here long enough, but we have four sessions, and so I've chosen some things that I think we all deal with on a pretty regular basis. Today I want to talk to you about pressing beyond guilt and shame. Pressing beyond guilt and shame and learning how to live with a righteousness consciousness rather than a sin consciousness. Learning how to live where you're not constantly, overly, and morbidly aware of all your flaws and your faults and your weaknesses and your failures, but actually grow to the point where you can celebrate some of your victories, some of your successes, and some of your growth. Do you know everybody in here is at a different place in their walk with God? We're at a different place on our journey. Some of you have further to go than others because you haven't been at it as long as others. But the good news is, as long as you're on your way, God counts it as a done deal. Because when he returns in the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed, completely transformed into his image. So in Matthew 5, 48, the Bible says, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, if you don't really understand what the Greek means there, that could be pretty scary. How in the world could we possibly be as perfect as God is? Let's look at that verse in the Amplified Bible. You therefore must be perfect, and this is what perfect means, growing, growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character, having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity as your heavenly Father is perfect. So we have God who was revealed to us in Christ. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we have him as our example. His character is what we want to emulate. His ways are the ways that we want to learn. But it's going to take a lifetime journey to do it. And even when he comes back to get us, we still will not have arrived at that place of perfection. But we don't need to be depressed and discouraged about that. All we need to do is what the Apostle Paul said to do. Be determined to take hold of those things for which Christ Jesus died, to take hold of you, letting go of what lies behind and pressing on to the good things that are ahead. We're going to go back to Philippians 3 where we were last night and share a little more about this than we did then. Philippians 3 verse 10. I love these verses, and I'm sure many of you do too. Paul starts out with what should be the most important thing to every believer. For I'm determined to know him. Not determined to get everything I want, but I am determined to know him. Not about him, but to know him. God wants us to love him for who he is, not what he does for us. Did you hear me? God wants us to love him for who he is, not just what he does for us. So Paul said, my determined purpose, he made his mind up, is to know him and the power of his resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while I'm in the body. He was pressing toward that place of Christ-likeness. Verse 12, not that I have now attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but I press on. Some of you are stuck somewhere in some old mistakes some old things that you ruined or messed up. And you've been stuck there so long 
that if you don't get unstuck today, you're going to lose the great future that Jesus died for you to have. Do any of you feel like maybe you're stuck somewhere and you need to be, have a little dynamite to blast you out of that? Well, you know, it's really our mind that gets stuck first. And if your mind is stuck, then your emotions are stuck. If you don't get your mind renewed, you're never going to get your life changed. So important to study and study and study and study what the Bible says about our thinking. I want you to have a different attitude today toward your mistakes. Not that we want to get up and make mistakes, not that we're delighted when we make mistakes, but we must understand that Jesus came and dealt with the sin problem. Sin is not dead, but we are dead to it. There's a part of us, the renewed part of us, that does not want to sin. If you were looking for an excuse to sin, you surely would not have come here today. So you could at least compliment yourself with this, I at least want to do what's right. Because there is a world full of people who just flat out don't care. But at least you care, and that puts a smile on God's face. So instead of being morbidly discouraged about what you're not, why don't you at least be a little bit proud of yourself today that at least you got out of bed, you got over here, you want to hear some word, you want to worship God, and you want to press on to the good things that are ahead. <clears throat> it's really, really important that we don't walk around with this vague sense of failure. Because the devil will start on you from the moment you open your eyes in the morning, and actually before they're open, if your mind is awake, telling you and rehearsing to you what you're not. You're not. You're not. You're not. You didn't. You're not. You're not. And I want to teach you today how to talk back to him and say, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. I'll be honest with you, if you don't learn how to talk back to the devil, it's going to be rough. You can talk out loud, you can talk in your head, but you got to learn how to not just sit around and put up with his lies. Not that I have already attained this, but I press on. I press on. You know, the Bible even says in Hebrews, don't be discouraged when God chastises you, but to brace up yourself and stand up tall and you know, don't, don't ever be discouraged when God shows you something that's wrong with you. That's a sign that He loves you and He cares about you. Have you ever said to one of your children, I'm only telling you this for your own good? You think they believe that? No, I, I'm, only, I'm only making you stand in the corner for your good. I'm only not letting you go to that party for your good. I'm only telling you this for your good. And when God chastises us and He shows us something that's wrong with us, that's good news. That means I can hear from God. That doesn't mean I have to get depressed and have a bad day and think I'm the worst person on the planet. I can rejoice that I can hear from God. Thank God that I can hear Him tell me what's wrong with me because I can't change what I don't know anything about. See, it's a different way of looking at things. It's just a different mindset. How many of you sometimes when God shows you a thing or maybe it's one of those periods in life where you're seeing a few things or maybe even more than a few things. It's like a whole bunch of things that needs to get fixed in your life. How many of you will admit that sometimes that really gets you down and gets you discouraged? But the Bible tells us not to be like that. It actually says that we should be enthusiastic and full of zeal when God shows us our faults. Because whom the Lord loves, he chastises. I'm only doing this for your good, is God's message to you today. So that would be a great place to start. If you have a problem with guilt and condemnation, the next time that God shows you that something needs to change in your life, or that you said something you shouldn't have said, or you acted in a way you shouldn't have acted, which may happen before you get out of the building, I mean, I had two ladies get in a fight one day in, the, in, in a bookstore in the church where I was at over who was going to get to buy the last teaching series on the message I had done on love. I would imagine they got convicted. I would imagine God tried to chastise them. I mean, just imagine how you'd feel. You just hear a message on love, 
And then you go out and get in an argument with somebody over who's going to buy that last teaching series on love. Well, I can imagine, you know, oh my God, how can I do that? And that's exactly what the enemy wants. And so I want you to take a whole different attitude, get a whole different mindset toward that. The next time that God shows you that you need to change something or you did something you shouldn't have done or you said something you shouldn't have said, first thing you want to say is, God, you're right. Don't ever argue with God. It's useless. God, you're right. I have no excuse. I am so sorry. Please forgive me. And I rejoice, God, that you care enough about me to take the time to show me that something in my life needs to be changed. You're not, well, you're a little happy, but you're not as happy as I'd like you to be. How many of you can see what a difference that would make in your whole mental outlook if you just wouldn't get down every time you see something that needs to change in your life? Good grief. I mean, I lived for years and years doing all kinds of stupid stuff and didn't even know I was doing it. <laughs> hurting people, didn't even know I was hurting them. Don't even know that I cared because my whole universe was about me. And now, I mean, if I hurt somebody, I know it right away. And I hate it. I don't like it. Well, that's something to rejoice about because that's evidence that God has changed me. And if you're sensitive to doing the right thing and you don't want to do the wrong thing, then that's something to rejoice about because that means that God is changing you. I told you this would be a happy day. He said, I press on. Verse 13, I do not consider, brethren, that I've captured and made it my own yet. You know, we, we've not arrived. We're not where we need to be, but thank God we're not where we used to be. But one thing I do, one thing I do, one thing I do, it is my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining, pressing forward to what lies ahead. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the supreme and the heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. Now, we're going to go on and read a little bit further than we normally do when we look at these verses. So let those of us who are spiritually mature, and I know we all like to think that's us, so we're going to just take a little quick test here. So let those of us who are spiritually mature and full grown have this mind and hold these convictions. Well, what's he talking about? He's saying, okay, we want to do what's right. We want to be perfect like God is perfect. We're going to keep pressing toward that mark. Here's one thing that's important. I've got to let go of what lies behind. Keep pressing toward the things that are ahead. So he's really saying, I'm not going to mess with this guilt, condemnation, shame, blame mess. I'm not going to live with that, dragging all that baggage around with me all the time, letting it steal my peace, steal my joy, steal my confidence, steal who I am in Christ. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to grow up and I'm going to act like I really believe the Bible that when I sin, I can repent and God will forgive me and completely cleanse me from all unrighteousness. We need to be excited about forgiveness rather than so depressed about our mistakes. How wonderful it is that when we make mistakes, we can ask God to forgive us, and He does. Why? Just because He wants to. He wants to have relationship with us, and the only way He can do that is to keep forgiving us and forgiving us and forgiving us. Now, this was a real eye-opener to me many years ago when I saw this, because I had a huge problem with guilt. I mean, that possibly was one of my biggest problems. I was abused in my childhood. Any child who's being mistreated normally thinks that there's something they're doing that's causing that. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? That record played over and over and over in my head for years and years and years. It was so deeply embedded in me that I was rooted in shame. I did not like myself. I didn't like who I was. It's a totally different thing to not like what you do than it is to not like who you are. Oh, 
I can tell I need to say that a few more times, but you'll catch up with me. It's one thing entirely to not like something you do. You know, I still have a few things in my life, just like anybody else, I'm still a little impatient, could keep my mouth shut a little bit more sometimes. A few other things. But you know what? I still like myself. Matter of fact, I'm just going to really act silly today and say I love myself. Not in a selfish, self-centered, oh, you're wonderful. That isn't what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about we are created by God with His very own hand. He created us in our mother's womb intricately, purposely, carefully. Who do you think you are to despise God's creation? To me, that's like a slap in God's face. I don't like what you've made. No, what, what we really don't like, we don't like some of the things we do, and, and that's not bad, but you have to learn how to separate your who from your do. <laughs> who you are is one thing, and if you don't know, now listen to me, if you don't know who you are, then you will never be able to properly deal with what you do that is wrong. Did you hear me? If you don't know who you are in Christ, how much He loves you, that your confidence is in Him, that you've been recreated in Him, born anew, a new creature, new nature. If you don't know who you are in Him, then you will never be able to deal properly with the things that you do. Because if you don't know who you are, the moment you get any kind of conviction or chastisement or any kind of accusation from the devil or anybody else out there, your automatic response is going to be guilt, shame, blame, I'm no good, I'm never going to make it. We start looking around at all the other people that we think are perfect because they act like they are. And then we compare ourselves with them and we compete with them and then we totally get lost in that whole mess and never get to find out who we are. This is such a problem with teenagers. Such a tremendous problem with teenagers. The peer pressure to be like everybody else. And if we can just teach our children to know who they are in Christ, and that they don't have to be like their brother, and they don't have to be like their sister, and they don't have to be like Johnny next door, and it doesn't matter if brother can play a guitar and we don't, can't even make a note right. Don't ever compare your children with one of your other siblings. Well, you know, why aren't you like Johnny? Well, why aren't you like somebody else? Because we all get up every day and do the best we can, and more than anything, people just want to be accepted for who they are and have a little bit of freedom. And you know what? If you're going to try to make me be like you so you can accept me, then you don't love me anyway. Woo! So you got to press past all this, what everybody thinks. And the people pleasing and excessive caring. Well, I want to be part of the group. Well, you know, you could even press past that and say, you know what, even if I have to be lonely for a little while, I would rather be lonely and happy than to be in a group and be miserable. <laughs> Did you hear me? I would rather be lonely and be happy and like myself and visit with myself than to be in a group and be miserable. A friend of mine who happens to travel with us had gained a lot of weight in her life at one time, and her and I were real open with, with each other, and we talk openly. And so I said to her one day, I said, does, does your weight bother you? And she said, you know what? She said, I don't like the fact that I've gained all the weight and I would definitely like to look better, but she said, it doesn't make me feel bad about myself because I really love myself. Well, you know what? See, most people 
Their who is totally connected to their do. Well, guess what? She's lost all the weight. And now I give her my clothes when I'm finished with them. And that's a good thing. She loves that. And I think a lot of times we want these outward things in life to prove to us that we're okay. And our whole motive for wanting to have them is haywire. If you've got to have an office at work with your name on the door and your name plaque on a, on a plate on your desk and, and you've got to have four or five degrees behind your name to think that you're okay, then you're always going to have your worth and value tied up in things that don't even make any sense. You got to know who you are. And let me tell you something, if you know who you are in God, you will be amazed at what He could do with you in your life. I mean totally, completely jaw-dropping amazed. Like totally. Amen? So let those of us who are spiritually mature <laughs> Have this attitude and mindset. I'm going to get up every day and do the best I can. I love God. You love God, you wouldn't be here. If you're still watching this television program, maybe even though you turned it on accidentally, you've got enough of something going on in there, if you've listened to me this long, to want to get to know God better, or you do know God and you want to change. So just quit persecuting yourself with your inventory of everything that's wrong with you. You're no surprise to God. He knew what he was getting when he got you. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean we don't want to change. I want to change. You're here because you want to change. But I've got to get you to understand that you cannot change if you're going to constantly be drugged back into the past by guilty feelings of everything that you did wrong yesterday. You can't make any progress today if you're going to be stuck in the mistakes of yesterday. Does anybody in the building understand that? Anybody? People are so loaded down with guilt and, and all these, I'm not, I'm not, I should be, and, and I'm not. I prayed five minutes a day, but it should have been 10. I read a chapter in the Bible, but it should have been six. I read the Bible every day, but I don't remember any of it. <laughs> Can I just set your heart at ease? I've been preaching the gospel for 32 years, and there are still occasions when I have to look at the index in the front of the book to find one of the books. Now, what do you think of that? And it's, I don't care one iota to tell you that. Doesn't bother me at all. Because it doesn't mean anything. God gives me what I need to know when I need to know it. And if I need to stand up here and look silly once in a while because I forget what I'm saying and can't find my place or whatever, then that only shows you that God uses cracked pots. Amen. So you can officially say, I'm going to see old Crackpot Joyce. <laughs> so do you understand that if you're going to have a spiritually mature attitude towards sin and forgiveness, then you must recognize your sin, ask God to forgive you, and then don't spend the next three days feeling guilty. Guilt is a dead work. Go to Hebrews 5. Beginning at verse 12. For even though by this time you ought to be teaching others. How many of you have been around long enough that really by now... <laughs> You could be a little further down the road than you are. You say, well, wait a minute. You just told me not to feel guilty. Now you're making me feel guilty. <laughs> no. See, that's the problem. If you got to feel guilty because I say that, it's not because I said it. It's because something is off in you. Why not just say, yeah, man, man, that's true. I've been doing this already 30 years, and I still like I'm a big baby sometimes. So... You know, yes, I should be further along. Let's help me find out today why I'm not. Not this, oh my God, I'm so terrible. I'm so terrible. 
That doesn't do one bit of good. Are you ready to press past feelings of guilt and shame? If you are, then you have to start believing what God says about you in His Word and stop listening to how you feel. Know who you are in Christ and know that God is ready and willing to forgive you, that He loves you unconditionally. And also remember that guilt is a dead work. All it does is condemn us. God may bring conviction in our life, but when He does, it's to lift us out of a problem, not to just press us down and make us feel bad. We're here at the Hand of Hope Medical Clinic in Angacha, Ethiopia. And Dave, I just wanted to ask you, what, what are you feeling as you come here and see the work that God's allowing us to do? Uh, I'm feeling humbled. I'm feeling thrilled, excited about what God's given us an opportunity to do. Uh, you know, when, when I look at this place, it was a rundown wreck at one time, and now it's so beautiful. The grounds are uh, actually, they say they're therapeutic to the people here, yeah, right. and uh, the people are excited about what what has happened here. But we're excited about what God is doing, how He's helping the people here in Mangacha, Ethiopia. We have the opportunity to yeah. help hurting people, and that's our goal, that's our desire, that's our hunger for, for Joyce Meyer Ministry. Well, one thing's for sure, we certainly love helping people and to see the smiles on the kids' faces and and to see the hope in their parents' eyes is just a, a phenomenal blessing. I can honestly say, I don't think that there's anything in the world that's better or gives you a better feeling than knowing that you're making a positive difference in somebody else's life. I love to be able to put a smile on someone's face. Thank you for helping us do that. Ik heb gelijk. Die ander heeft het fout. Eén woord te veel en je hebt een knallende ruzie. En niemand heeft het gewild. Het kan ook anders. En ontdek nu hoe. Nu verkrijgbaar van Joyce Meyer. Leven zonder conflicten. Bestel nu het boek Leven zonder conflicten. Via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meijer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard.